Now let's be honest, uh, if someone was a visiting preacher and they said, I'm going to preach this evening on 2 Samuel chapter 21 verses 1 to 14, uh, we'd all be going, oh really? Now why of all the passages to pick to preach on, would you pick this one? Uh, unless you are working your way through a book together. Uh, it's uh, hi highly unlikely that we will ever hear someone turn up to want to preach on this passage uh, this evening. And there are various obvious reasons for that. It is incredibly uncomfortable, it is gruesome, and it is a passage that is particularly challenging to some of our sensitivities uh, today, culturally, uh, to say the least. And yet, there is a very obvious clue uh, to help us understand how we should begin to look at this passage. The answer is there, found in verse 3. Uh, when David asks the Gibeonites, what shall I do for you? How shall I make atonement? Uh, this is a passage that is, is, is about making atonement. That is, making something right. Something that has been broken and severely damaged needs to be dealt with and corrected. And this is a passage that looks at not only atonement, but it very, I think, obviously jumps us forward to think about our atonement. And that is the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that, therefore, if there's ever a time to look at this passage, actually it is quite apt to consider it together on a Sunday evening uh, when we're celebrating communion together. Uh, the very picture and representation of the atonement that Jesus Christ brought uh, for us. Uh, we're not told exactly when in David's reign these events took place. Uh, we do a, a slight hint, though. Uh, we're told in verse 7 uh, that the king spared Mephibosheth, son of Jonathan. Uh, so this obviously wasn't right at the beginning of David's reign. We know that from 2 Samuel chapter 9, uh, David didn't know that Mephibosheth had survived uh, um, Saul's uh, and Jonathan's loss in battle. Uh, he didn't know that Mephibosheth had been hidden away. Uh, and, and it was after David had been king for a while, he tracks down and finds Saul's descendant, he finds Mephibosheth, uh, invites him to the palace, and he comes and lives there and is supported by food from David's table. Uh, so this wasn't right at the start of David's reign, but it's certainly something that takes place uh, at, at a later point. Uh, one of the troubles is, is reading through, looking at various commentators during the week about as we you know, think about this passage, um, there are a whole load of them who do not like this passage at all. And well, I think we can all sympathise with that view. Um, there are a few uh, who try to sort of rewrite and reinterpret uh, some of the ways the, and the actions here. Uh, there are a couple even that go as far to, to assert that everybody in this passage is sinning uh, just about all over the place. Uh, and it comes to being tantamount to say that God really shouldn't have sort of put it in here because what we have here is God tolerating and really responding quite positively by the end of the passage there at verse 14 uh, to some sinful actions as God then you know, changes the, the, the judgment on the land and gives them food where there had been famine. Um, but as I said, the obvious way of, right there is an obvious way of understanding it and hopefully uh, that will become clearer if it isn't perhaps already beginning to dawn on you uh, together this evening. So we're going to think about this passage uh, with uh, three headings as we just work through it uh, before we come around the table for communion together. Uh, and the first is that we see that there is something revealed. Revealed. And we're told there straight off in verse 1 uh, that during the reign of David there was a famine for three successive years. Now, famines in Israel and that part of the world weren't entirely unheard of. It was uh, an area where perhaps we might say famines at times have been more common, uh, certainly because of the environment and the areas around there, but sometimes also it's because of economic factors uh, that were picked up uh, within the lands as well. Uh, famines are often read of in, in, in biblical stories, aren't there? You know, Joseph in Egypt, there was a famine there, and time and again uh, we read of famines uh, being, uh, being influential in the land. And so you go, well, okay, there's a famine in the land, but does that really mean anything significant? Well, it does, doesn't it? 
You know, we're told this is a famine that takes place for three successive years. This is very deliberate. Why? Well, just think about the language that's used to describe the land of Israel, the land of Canaan that the Israelites were given by God. It's described as the promised land, a land flowing with milk and honey. It is the land of blessing. It is the land where God had promised to not only be with his people, but to be a place where his people would be able to enjoy every good thing from him. And so when there's an absence of it, rightly, there becomes a period of questioning. And they begin to, and obviously David feels that there is something to be sought from God. We're told that in verse 1. David sought the face of the Lord. Why? Because actually famine was a sign of their disobedience to God. Just turn back, if you can, to Deuteronomy chapter 28. This is right at the end of Moses' life, and he's re-establishing with the people uh, the covenant promises or curses, depending on whether they are obedient with God or disobedient with him. Uh, God had given them clear in understanding as to whether they were in favour with God or out of favour, depending on their obedience. Uh, Deuteronomy uh, chapter 28, have a look from uh, verse 15. Uh, this is where the, 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 the indication that famine is a problem uh, it starts to crop up. Uh, Moses writes here, however, if you do not obey the Lord your God and do not carefully follow all his commands and decrees I'm giving you today, all these curses will come on you and overtake you. And just skip down to verse 24 for the first thing. Uh, it says there that the Lord will turn the rain of your country into dust and powder. It will come down from the skies until you are destroyed. And then have a look down over at verse 38. Uh, you will sow much seed in the field, but you will harvest little because locusts will devour it. You will plant vineyards and cultivate them, but you will not drink the wine or gather the grapes because worms will eat them. You will have olive trees throughout your country, but you will not use the oil because the olives will drop off. It says, if there's a problem with you, between your obedience to me, I'm going to make it known. It's through famine. The knock-on impact of there being a lack of food in the land was going to be one of the ways in which God made it abundantly clear that there had been sin in Israel that had hadn't yet been dealt with. And so David, as he seeks the Lord's face, uh, we're told in verse 1, is told by the Lord, it is on account of Saul and his blood-stained house, it is because he put the Gibeonites to death. Well, if you remember uh, Joshua chapter 9, as the Israelites are about to enter into the promised land, uh, they, the, a party of people pretending to come from a far-off country, it was the Gibeonites in disguise, uh, turned up and said to Joshua, we, we, we've heard that you're a great people, your God is going to give you the land, we want to make a treaty with you. Um, Joshua makes a treaty with them, it is only afterwards that he realises that they are uh, Gibeonites in the land that God has said that uh, there are people to be removed, and Joshua says, we're going to honour it. We're not going to dishonour God and go back on a promise that we have made with you before the Lord. And God seems to honour uh, that, uh, that promise that, the, the Israel, that Joshua and the Israelites made with the Gibeonites, and they were able to sort of dwell amongst the people of Israel. And the Lord says, Saul's broken that promise. That Saul dishonoured me. Saul caused my name to be brought into disrepute as he trashed the promise that you as God's people had made with the Gibeonites. The trouble comes is this, is that Saul is acting as, when he did that, he was the king. It wasn't just a private, personal man carrying out a vendetta against the people that he didn't like in his country. As king, he was dependent, he, he, he should have been uh, the example. He, he had to follow and abide by all the rules and all the laws and all the treaties that had been set up. He, he had to honour God in that way. He was the, he was the figurehead. So when Saul uses Israel's army to go and attack the Gibeonites again at a time that we're not told uh, when it occurred in his reign, but when he did that, you know, the king's actions brought sin and shame upon all of God's people. Uh, he was like their federal head, you know, their figurehead, and their, 
his sin impacted everyone. It's a similar picture, isn't it, when we think of the Garden of Eden. Adam sinned, and his sin impacted everyone. And God says, because of that, you're going to be made to feel that there is a problem between you as my people and me because of that our sin that is yet to be dealt with. We do need to be careful with this passage, though. Uh, it does, this doesn't mean that current problems or upsets are a result of unrepentant sin in your life or my life at present. Sometimes that can be the case, but as we see here in the passage, God is extremely clear as to what this is about. Even when we think of David, you know, and his sin with Bathsheba and the problems that came about there, they were all direct consequences. You know, for example, if you have someone who's an alcoholic, it is quite likely that they may end up having liver problems at some point. You know, a direct consequence, an obvious perhaps, if we like, linked to that. This wasn't something obvious. God had to make it really clear to them. He wanted to make it plain because God's desire is that you and I should live, his people should live, in harmony with him. God actually is incredibly merciful here to the people of Israel. He reveals to them that there is something in their conduct, something that they have done that is not right between them and God. Actually, God often does the same things today, doesn't he? Doesn't God often reveal to you and me the things that aren't right yet in our lives with him? Now, it's not necessarily going to be through a famine. You know, if you turned up at you know, one of your supermarkets during the week and found the shelves empty, that's not because you've done something wrong. Said, how does God make it plain to you and I when there are things that aren't right in our relationship with him? Well, occasionally he does that by our friends. <coughs> our friends pointing out and saying, look, your conduct here hasn't been quite right. There's something that's been at error. It is often, though, and more, more often, I think, done through the word of God by the application of the Holy Spirit. You know, it's like as we read God's word, as we search God's scriptures and, and we find that there are character traits or, or elements that, that God speaks about that says, you know, these things are wrong. And, and we suddenly become deeply convicted by the Holy Spirit, because of the work of the Holy Spirit in our hearts, that there are things in us that need to be corrected. Sometimes it's by our conscience. You know, we're just troubled. We know that we've strayed from God and erred in some way and we want to have that relationship restored and enjoyed. How do you respond when God exposes, reveals to you something in your own heart, in your own character that doesn't fit with being someone of God's people? And nobody likes having their problems pointed out to them, do they? Maybe you can remember times where things have been pointed out to you when you were younger and you threw a tantrum about it. Got really upset. You decided to lash back and say to someone else, well, you know, you haven't done this. And we can't do that with God, can we? But instead, when, when God points out our problems, what's the right response? Humility and repentance. It's exactly what we see going to be taking place here in this passage. God will point out your sin to you. He'll point out to me. It's not your sin, but my sin, right? Don't you? He does that. And don't we actually want that as God's people? To understand how we should be walking to God with God so that there is nothing that might interfere or lessen our enjoyment of all of God's benefits and blessings as his people, that we might be able to enjoy his peace be able to enjoy his favour, might be able to enjoy walking in closeness with God and in communion uh, with him. And secondly, we have uh, redemption. Uh, we know how the Bible says sin should be dealt with. Uh, sin is to be dealt with, uh, obviously, seen firstly in the Old Testament and then 
explicitly explained in the New Testament by sacrifice, meaning you know, the death of the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross. That is the only way that sin can truly, properly, finally be dealt with. See, sin has a huge cost. It is not something cheap. It's not something easy to be dealt with and removed. Uh, from verse 2, uh, we have this very strange, really, sort of conversation that goes on between David and the Gibeonites as they begin to try to work out what is the way in which Saul's sin to them needed to be atoned for, dealt with, removed. Uh, they do, I think, really helpfully uh, say in verse 4, uh, we have no right to demand silver or gold from Saul or his family, nor do we have the right to put anyone in Israel to death. And say, David, this isn't a matter of let's pay some money and sort everything out. Uh, no matter how much money you pay, sin will never, ever be removed. It's one of the tragedies at times over the years of people who believe that if you pay money to the church, you, 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 your sin will be dealt with. It's a load of rubbish. Uh, uh, Isaiah writes um, in, Psalm, in his Isaiah chapter 52, verse 3, you know that wonderful passage looking at how salvation is brought about. Isaiah 52, verse 3, you shall not be redeemed, sorry, you shall be redeemed without money. So Peter, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 18, Peter goes on, to, Peter says to people there, you have been redeemed by some, by, not by something perishable like silver or, or and gold, but with the precious blood of the Lamb. You know, it's know that it's not by, you know, paying something isn't just going to deal with it. But also they recognise this, they're not going to just go around mindlessly putting people to death as a, like, you killed us, now we kill you, and we'll call it all quits. They want this to be done in the right legal framework. They want it to be done in the right, with the right systems and the right methods. And one of the things that would have happened when, they met, when, the, uh, when Joshua, Joshua uh, made the covenant with the Gibeonites is that there would have been the offering of a sacrifice. And they would have stood either side of the altar with an animal sacrifice on it. And they would have said something along the lines of, you know, if we break this covenant, we deserve to take the place of the sacrifice. That would have been, that was the impression, and that was part of the process of making a covenant. The Gibeonites are completely right in demanding, or asking at least, that there is a blood sacrifice to cover the breaking of the covenant that had been made. Uh, they say and ask for seven of Saul's sons, seven being one of the perfect numbers or a sign of completeness in the Bible. Uh, David agrees uh, and he chooses the, the men to be selected for this really gruesome uh, and terrifying uh, ordeal. Uh, we're told that he obviously spares Mephibosheth. But there was obviously another uh, son of Saul's called Mephibosheth. There's another man named Barzillai, who's not the same Barzillai that we've read about already in 2 Samuel. And these seven uh, men are taken and they are put to death at the barley harvest. What we do need to point out here is right at the end of the passage, we're told that God answered their prayers. Now, what happened here was not, you know, a big, it was not, condemned by God. Instead, God looked on this and understood the sacrifice that this was carrying out instead. You go, this is really uncomfortable. Uh, let's move on from it. Well, actually, the writer doesn't let us do that, does he? Okay, the writer then gives us this heartbreaking details of you know, this widow, of this mum who watches over the the bodies of her sons who have been killed in this uh, as a sacrifice for the people to cover their own sin and it's just heartbreaking now we want to sort of look at this and go right that's it there's that really nasty business done and over let's skip away from it and i you know we, we all understand that one and we don't like gazing on it too much do we but why does this passage dwell on these things I think it's this. 
think it's because we are supposed to remember the price that is paid for our sin to be dealt with. We, we need to remember that, that the cost of sin and what it takes in order for this problem of sin to be resolved, in order for the law to be satisfied, in order for sin to be overlooked and pardoned. We don't want, you know, it doesn't, we're not allowed to move on from this quickly. Which is part of the reason, isn't it, why we have and celebrate as a church over and over again, no, the Lord's Supper as we will this evening. Because as a, though we, we don't like looking on the suffering of our Lord Jesus Christ, we don't like looking at the cross and seeing all that he endured so that you and I might be forgiven. We don't enjoy looking and thinking about how his how he was pierced and bruised and beaten and forsaken for us. Yet what are we called to do as believers? But to keep remembering him. We have to keep remembering, as we sing in some of our hymns, the price of our redemption. No, the, 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 what it cost for our sin to be expunged in the face of of God. We don't like, do we, looking at the cost of our sin and our Christ on the cross because it's it's too upsetting. No, we hate the thought that it was our sin and our guilt that let brought, put Jesus there for us. And yet there is also something wonderfully delightful in seeing Christ on the cross. Because as we look at our Saviour hanging on the cross, what are we seeing? We're seeing God demonstrating his love for us. We're seeing the vastness of God's grace and mercy and compassion. We're seeing a God displaying the most loving and overwhelmingly delight pleasing thing to God that could ever possibly be done. That's why as Christians we should want to think about our... Uh, the saviour who died and rose again we want to be reminded don't we that our sin exacted a great price and that that great price has been paid for <coughs> that the, the, the price is no longer held against us that it's been dealt with and taken that everything that should have been ours has been laid on him We remember our salvation. We remember the, what Jesus did to atone. It shows us his love, but it also should strengthen our hatred of our own sin. It speaks to us again that our hearts should not be chasing after our own desires. It should also speak to us as we remind ourselves again uh, well, of the very reasons why we should praise him be thankful and humble in his sight when we gaze at the price of that was paid for us to be redeemed for atonement to be made with God we're going to find conflicting thoughts aren't we we hate seeing it and yet we love it because it is where God's mercy and justice are perfectly met and I think that's the picture we have here a scene that's horrible and yet at the same time, there is something beautiful about sin being dealt with and removed from the people. And then thirdly, we have restored. And we're very thankful, aren't we, for verse 14, and particularly that very last line of verse 14 in this passage. You know, after that, after everything that took place, after this horrendous scene, God answered prayer on behalf of the Lamb. The remedy for sin brought God's favour. And they can enjoy a uh, freedom and, and a relationship with God. The, the sacrifice satisfied the demands of the law. Everything was met. Their enjoyment of God and God's enjoyment of them was, there, was then granted for them to receive again. Actually, I think it's really helpfully 
I just described in a hymn. I, you, I didn't pick it for this evening. I nearly did. But it is, it's one of my favourite hymns. You know, Tis finished, the Messiah dies. Cut off the sins, but not his own. Accomplished is the sacrifice. The great redeeming work is done. Tis finished. All the debt is paid. Justice divine is satisfied. The grand and full atonement made. God for a guilty world has died. And the hymn goes on wonderfully to explain what we then look forward to as Christians. We look that all the blessings and all the merits of the Lord Jesus Christ are ours. And the relationship that we enjoy with God is because of everything that he has achieved. when relationships are restored with God they're not like human relationships you know, when someone's offended you when you, you know, try and when you reconcile together we might for a time have find that that relationship is kind of always reset to that neutral position now we don't feel really against them any longer but we're not entirely for them you know there's there's a period where that relationship has to be rebuilt and re uh, sort of an, and refocused and, and enjoyed again in order for, for trust and enjoyment and closeness to be. And yet, this passage is something different, doesn't it? After that, God answered prayer on behalf of the Lamb. Having made atonement for their sin. All of God's previous blessings that they had enjoyed were given to them again. Total, full, complete enjoyment. Actually, just turn, if you can, to Romans chapter 5. This is what this is something that Paul says uh, along the lines of in Romans chapter 5. We'll read from verse 17 of Romans chapter 5. He says, For if by the trespass of one man death reigned through that one man, how much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and the gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Christ Jesus Christ? Consequently, just as one trespass resulted in condemnation for all people, so also one righteous act resulted in justification and life for all people. For just as through the obedience of one, or sorry, disobedience of one man, the many were made sinners, so also through the obedience of one man, the many will be made righteous. It's a perfect description, isn't it, of what's happening here. One man's disobedience, they all felt guilty. Because of this obedience, life, righteousness, enjoyment with God. It's a great, it's a picture, isn't it, of that greater arc of, uh, of our relationship with God. Adam sinned, death spread to all. Jesus died. Life comes to all who profess faith in him. There's another slightly smaller, but a little forward, greater, f further forward pointing, in, uh, I think, hint in this as well. You know, there's a famine at the beginning of, the, of, the, of this, this narrative. At the end, God answers their blessings. And, and what is the opposite, uh, sort of answers their prayers. And, and what is the opposite of, of famine? Well, it's a feast, isn't it? It's plenty. And what is heaven described like? Matthew 22, heaven is described as by Jesus there as being like a wedding feast. It's a feast. You know, the outcome of dealing with sin is, is, a, is, is, is a future blessing, a future feast with God of all of his riches. And something that we can look forward to and anticipate as we know at one in time to come uh, the fullness of our salvation that we've already begun to taste now our salvation was purchased as we know at a great price but great will be our rejoicing when we finally see and enjoy the fullness of it 
in far greater way than we, than we know at present, but with our risen Saviour in the life to come. Before we, as we come around uh, the, the table then, 